But some things are, are, are ends and of themselves, right? It is just a good thing to have read Treasure Island, Carrie. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That, was, that a, was that a dig? <laughs> it was. Um, Welcome to the Homeschool Journal, a show that unpacks the joys and journeys of the classical homeschool family. Here's your host, Carrie McGraw. Just in case you are coming into part two here, before you've watched part one of our podcast with Paul Schaefer, our director of Memorial Press Online Academy, just want to remind you, we're going over seventh through 12th grades to the credit of one of our viewers who commented and said, hey, why don't you do this? Um, And we are answering today with Paul. We've done a part one and part one covered Latin, Uh, with grammar and Greek, math, science, and modern studies. But today with Paul, we're going to cover literature, Mm -hmm. classical and Christian studies, composition and logic. Now, Paul, I have to say, there's a lot to cover again on this one. And and literature, we're going to start with literature. And and that's because, it. well, it kind of gets me a little giddy. I'm so excited. Um, There's so much. I'm going to end up looking at my list because I can't Mm -hmm. remember Mm -hmm. All of them, right? Um, but I do remember reading them with my children. Um, I remember, uh, well, I still have them in my house, mm-hmm. um, and, and maybe we'll get to personal stories. But um, let's jump into literature. This rich, it, it's the big one for me. It's it's so rich, and it's you know, in working with homeschoolers, so many times they come into Memorial Press because they've seen our literature. Mm-hmm. And they love the beauty of the books that we choose for for children in these years. And but also like this list is <laughs> aspirational. Oh, amen. Right. So it is. You know, my wife and I have this this struggle of like, why do we read books? Right. I read books because in some ways I like existential angst at the end, where or like moral angst. And saying, was was that decision a right one? Like, what would have happened? Like, when it raises questions. My wife likes to read books because she enjoys them, right? Mm-hmm. She just likes the story, right? She doesn't want to think more deeply about it. Um, and so, you know, for parents that are more like my wife, this is intimidating because sometimes these, these books are not easy to read, mm-hmm. right? But they all are dealing with the universal human condition. And so, um, you know, again, this is aspirational. Like, take that, take this with a grain of salt. Right. But we start with some really happy, fun, and and beautiful books. The Hobbit in seventh grade, Bronze Bow, mm-hmm. Anne of Green Gables, Trojan War. That's that's a little <laughs> tougher, well, but it's good. Uh, I mean, it should be there. And then and then also in seventh grade, we finish out uh, poetry for the grammar stage. That's right. And and we're gonna hear a little bit of theme on on poetry here. But but talk to me about these selections for seventh grade. What do you think? Well, I. For one, I I love Anne of Green Gables. I've sat in classrooms yes. where teachers are teaching Anne of Green Gables, and and the boys are in some ways like they don't want to show it. They don't want to admit it, but they are they way not. into that book. Um, you know, but you that one is is sort of near and dear to my heart because you know when we had foster kids in the home, and it was it was cathar- it was therapeutic for. Um, this ten year old in our home to read that book and realize other people go through this too, and and for those kids that aren't going through that, it's good for them to realize other people go through hard things, and um, you know it's the same. I mean, The Hobbit, you know, going through going on a journey, right, and a journey that was not Bilbo. You know, he was a Hobbit. Mm-hmm. He was supposed to stay at home and drink his tea and have mm-hmm. second breakfast. Like I, I mean, that sounds wonderful <laughs> to me. Yeah, I know, <laughs> <laughs> but he goes on this amazing journey and he learns so much. And sets in motion things that are going to change his world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and and that's those are sorts the sorts of conversations and, and ideals we want to present to our kids, especially in this in this age where they're starting to change. They're starting to to think about you Middle know what's, school. what's it mean to be an adult, you mm-hmm. know. And so those are those are great things. The bronze bow and bringing you know the idea of this child at the time of Christ and struggling with what is this, you know, what does it mean to have a savior, right? Um, and then, and, and the Trojan War, yes. You, you just kids, have to do it. Well, you, you get it into <laughs> adulthood. Awesome. War exists, right? <laughs> but also, it's a preparation for Homer. Like, it you, you, without it, you're going to be lost. Because, right. you know, some people that haven't read the Iliad, they think, well, it's going to cover, you know, the whole Trojan War. No, it covers like 52 days. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Um, it's a number I pulled out of random. I mean, it's something <laughs> around 50 days. 
it's not it's not long and so they do need that that background and it. it is a literature book so it gives them um you know the vocabulary work the the comprehension yes. work the again laying a groundwork that's right that's okay. right Seventh grade. So eighth grade, we have some other of my favorites, Treasure Island, Wind in the Willows. I have to pause at that one. That's like <laughs> one of my all-time favorites. Um, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, um, Poetry and Short Stories. And then we introduce Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Can I do a drum roll on that one? Sure. Go right ahead. I don't know if that comes out. Shakespeare, well. as you like it. Uh-huh. Um, and and there's so many reasons for that, but I want to hear what you have to say about this these selections Look, in eighth grade. I'm going to admit, I don't have in recent memory that I've read as you like it. Um so I can't I can't talk about that one. It's okay. But But you can talk about Shakespeare anytime sure, you want to. Sure, I talk about right. Shakespeare. You know, um and I I remember um, you know, when I was in high school, they we'd read Shakespeare plays and then we'd have to um, we'd all get parts and we'd perform Act it. Out. Mm -hmm. It was great. Um, and I hated it. I hated <laughs> it. But now, like, I kind of want to get back. I, like, I want to go, like, join a community theater. Like, I think it would be so fun as an adult to do I would, that. I would come watch you. Uh, <laughs> I would come, I would come <laughs> you're going to join me. You're going to watch well, me. I, okay, I'll do that. I'll do Lady Macbeth. Can I do that? Oh, one? there you go. <laughs> um, uh, I remember Michelle Luoma doing Macbeth. Lady Macbeth in, in Cheryl Lowe's classroom. Like, <laughs> she was doing the soliloquy. Um you know, one of my favorite lines in Julius Caesar, which we're going to get to Shakespeare's Julius Caesar's, you know, this, this was the back and forth of, you know, um, will you sup with me tonight? Uh, no, uh, nay, I will not. You know, <laughs> will you dine with me tomorrow? I don't know why it just really caught my imagination of, of, you know, just the invitation to a meal, right. Mm -hmm. Which is going to drag him into betraying Caesar. Right. It's, it's like, there are there are beautiful moments in there. There are moments that kids easily understand. There are moments that that even adults struggle adults, to understand. Right. And um, but we all become better human beings by struggling through things, right? If we feed our kids literature that's not difficult, they'll never rise to that occasion. Amen. Amen. So. So since we're on Shakespeare, we're just going to stay on Shakespeare for, for a moment, even though we just brought him in in eighth grade, just barely. Um, it, how does a parent that's, and you said this, some of these are even difficult for parents and mm -hmm. parents that don't have a background in Shakespeare, because we're going to, in Memorial Press, offer a lot of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, how does a parent get through that um, when you don't have that background or you, yeah. you just don't really know and you're struggling with it yourself. Right. I would, I would do a, a few different things. One is the, the version of the text itself. So you need a version that has good footnotes. Mm -hmm. That's going to explain vocabulary, going to explain, um, context, cultural things that Shakespeare's referencing. Um, another is obviously we, we have the study guides. Those teacher guides are fairly extensive, um, of on um, what's going on, uh, we do offer the online academy, but I would also say go go um, find who is this performances? Rich is it Richard Brana? Um, is that who I'm thinking of? Oh, um, Kenneth Brana. Kenneth Brana. Yes. Yeah. And you know, go find performances of Shakespeare that are good, that are good, good that are even still using the same language yes. or close to, because you know. Shakespeare was meant to be performed. Right. And by seeing it performed. That physical interpretation. Yeah. You're going to miss some of the, what, what they, what they're saying. Like you, you're not going to understand some of the dialogue possibly, but by the performance, it will become clear what mm -hmm. is being said. And so that can help the student and the parent understand what's going on in the play. Um, and also drive home. Sometimes when you're reading the text, like, you know, uh, thinking, what is it? It's um, in Hamlet, right? When Polonius gets killed behind the curtain, right? Like, you don't realize how dramatic that is sometimes just reading it, right? right? And so if if you can find a good performance, I really would do that um, as a way to make that come alive. To, very, to, very to yourself good advice. And students. So we didn't do much credit in eighth grade to Wind in the Willows. Can we talk about that for a moment? <laughs> I'm going to have to cry uncle and let you talk about Wind in the Willows. I, you know, Wind in the Willows to me is just that, that precious story um, of, of friendship, of hospitality, of, of a journey. We talked about the mm -hmm. journey in Hobbit and, um, and, and Mole and his friends. And, and I would ask parents just to, 
to just really enjoy that book Mm -hmm. with their children. So moving on, we have ninth grade. We have a shortened version of Beowulf, Book of the Middle Ages, Poetry, Prose, and Drama, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, A Midsummer Night's Dream. There we go, Shakespeare again. And The Hound of Baskervilles. Mm -hmm. What do you think about all of that one? Well, look, there's... I think we need to just talk about the fact that, again, this is aspirational. Mm-hmm. I mean, The Hound of Baskervilles is one of my favorite kids' mm-hmm. favorite stories as a kid. Um, it's it's quite, um, it's it's like a horror movie without being a horror movie um, in some ways. But it is, uh, it's really not that, I mean, for it, it's a little scary, but it's, you know. Uh, it's kind it, of a new genre in that. Yeah, in that, and it's that, that, that we mystery, introduce. you know. Right. And, and so, you know, but, but, um, you know, what we're trying to do is just choose the best things for that age level. Like there's, because they're all dealing with universal themes, right? Yeah, we are introducing genres. We are introducing authors for them to, you know, gain those skills. But we're also just saying what, you know, to to deal with Beowulf as a ninth grader can deal with Beowulf, right? In a shortened mm-hmm. version, you know, like that is, is worthwhile because the story is is i mean it was pivotal for civilization right mm-hmm. so you know we're trying to introduce those things that they absolutely cannot miss right um and it's a hard thing to choose it's so hard it's a hard it's thing so to choose hard, right we could argue but all day long about chosen. whether yeah we right. could argue all day long about these titles and and we do actually have some um some guides and some other pieces of literature that are, that are not in our core That's that right. you can can choose from mm-hmm. um but these are what we recommend in our core and it's a hard choice so 10th grade we go into scarlet letter uh, Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. Julius Caesar mm-hmm. that you mentioned. I love it. I know. Pride and Prejudice. Oh, that's kind of a love hate for some of the boys. But <laughs> I got to say, been there, done that, by that one. Point, by that point, they're no longer interested like they were in Anne of Green Gables. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's yeah. not cute anymore to them, that's for sure. <laughs> um, the British Tradition too, which is a poetry anthology of El- Elizabethan age up through the neoclassical mm-hmm. age. But, you know, you said this earlier, we keep poetry yeah. for a very specific reason. That poetry, you know, as we read it, we're able to read about. Reading yeah, about. yeah, yeah. I mean, you're reading about literature, but you're also like, <laughs> for us to teach Latin and teach grammar and try to become masters of language. But ne- but if we didn't get to poetry, if we didn't get to sort of the mastery of language where we are expressing our ideas and concepts in the most beautiful way possible, mm-hmm. then we would be missing something. Right. Right. And so poetry, uh, it's, you know, for it's every non lit majors thing to hate in literature class. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, because it can seem superfluous. Mm-hmm. Um, it can seem haughty. Um, but just, you need to just sit there with it. And the more, the more you're exposed to it, and it's okay to not like some poets and like other oh, poets. Absolutely. Um, but the more you're exposed to it, the more you will find um, beauty in words. Amen. All right. So 11th and 12th, mm. and I want you to make the case for some of these. <laughs> we have Dante's Divine Comedy. Yes. Um, we move into more Shakespeare, Hamlet, and Macbeth. There's not much of a case you have to make for that one. Sorry. Those are, you know, just really good. Um, but I think we might have to make a case for Anna Karenina. I, I, <laughs> Such a good book. I know. It changed I know, my life. I know, I it changed know. my life. You've also got Tale of Two Cities, uh, some more poetry, British mm-hmm. tradition uh, three that takes us uh, into the Victorian yeah. age. But I really want to key in on Dante yes. and Anna Karenina because I'm going to say, well, I'm going to jump. Anna Karenina is not one that people might may choose to pick up, but it turned out to be my son's favorite. Oh, it really? It did. It did. There's a story behind that. But. Wow. <laughs> Um, I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, I mean, it's a great book. Uh, okay, look. So I was on a panel once and somebody asked the panel, like, what what books have you read that have changed your life? And I was like, Anna Karenina, hands down, changed my life. I, I argue with Martin that it's not the best novel ever written, but it is up there. It's mm-hmm. very close. And look, it it, I mean, at its core, it's contrasting a... Um, an unfaithful couple with a faithful couple. Yes. Right. And so, yeah, that's why we leave it for senior year. Yes. You know, we're not doing that in freshman year. Um, but it, it deals with, um, it, 
thematically, you know, not only is it dealing with those two things, right? Relationships, it's dealing with agrarianism and it's dealing with, with cities. It's, you know, there's, there's a conversation in there about classical education, right? And whether it's worth anything, uh, it's dealing with aristocracy and democracy. It's, there's, there's so many things that so it's dealing things. with, um, but it is, but it absolutely paints a picture of, um, I think what the good life is, mm-hmm. right? And just the 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 image of, uh, you know, Kitty coming into Levin's brother who's dying, who's living with a prostitute, because, you know, and and her out of her faith, knowing how to take care of him, where Levin, who is agnostic, has no idea what to do in the face of death. It is one of the most beautiful scenes in literature. Um, one of what I've been told is the most boring scene in literature is the one that changed my life, uh, which is Levin mowing the grass in the field. Oh, that is absolutely <laughs> was pivotal for me to say, I want to go live out in the country because, and you did it. I did it. I did it. <laughs> and I, I don't mow with a scythe, but I mow or a sickle, but I mow with a tractor. Um, but it, it really, it, it painted this picture of to really be human. And I think you can be, I, I will not say that you can't be human in a city, but it painted this picture of like Levin's kind of finding his humanity and his faith in nature. Um, that's right. We teach nature studies in the lower mm-hmm. school. Right. Um, and it's just, it's such a beautiful portrayal of all of that. But we do leave it to 12th grade. We do leave it. And to there 12th. is a great purpose in that. There's, and that's, yeah. Um, but for, for my son, it was much of what you said in that that juxtaposition of virtue and lack thereof and of, of virtue in its acts, um, you know, overshadowing that which had not been virtuous. I mean, just. Right. And you see the um, consequences <clears throat> of vice and virtue oh, without him. He doesn't beat you over the head with it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so it is one in which you you desire that virtue that he presents in front mm-hmm. of you rather than, rather than this sort of reticence of like, Oh, you know what? That couple of those unfaithful, that sounds really good. No, it's like, it's looked horrible, you know? Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's so, so convincing of a world too, that you really, you really just like, I, I felt when I finished it, like I walked out of, you know, it's sort of like I walked out of the wardrobe, right? Into a different world, back into my old world, mm-hmm. because I, you know, Tolstoy is so good about creating that. that and that I world. think our study um, does a, a wonderful job and helps parents to to walk through that, you know, with our children. Now, what about any comments on Dante? Dante was well-educated, right? So he's making constant allusions that, you know, even though we've tried to prepare our students for it, that we're going to miss a lot. And it's okay to miss a lot because you're going to have to reread it like six times in your life anyway, you know. And it's okay as a parent to reach out for resources that you need. That's right. And just like we said with Shakespeare, yeah. right? Right. Okay, we've got to move on. Classical and Christian studies, okay? Um, I feel like this has to follow literature because mm-hmm. we have, there's a, there's a lot of connectivity yeah. that Memorial Press um, makes um, to, to make sure that we are a cohesive and um, connective curriculum, um, and that there's a trajectory that parents can depend upon. So in classical and Christian studies, and um, we finish out our Famous Men series, mm-hmm. um, really in in seventh grade, Famous Men of Greece. Um, we do Horatius at the Bridge. Um, there's some Christian studies for, which is really kind of a standalone. I mean, you can do Christian you studies for. You can absolutely for, do that by it's, itself. It's, it's a review. Well, yeah, in the online academy, we just call it Bible literacy. Okay. I mean, it's a one-year okay. course called Bible literacy that does Christian studies for. So it's absolutely standalone. Great. Uh, Book of the Ancient World and, and, and Greeks and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about, I really want to key in on a couple things. Um, by the way, we have a Famous Men of Virtue series that's on our YouTube channel. We do. Right? Yeah, going through so, the, some and Famous Men. we are men. still going through mm-hmm. it. Um, but I want to key in on two things, Horatius and Homer. Do you want to comment on either one of and those? Alice Big Brave Horatius, the captain of the gates. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mrs. Lowe had to... Correct me in front of the whole class because I said the captain of the gate. And she was like, what is this, Captain Crunch? Um, I they never will forget it. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of those kids that only had to do like six or 12 stanzas instead of the whole thing. Um, lucky, I say lucky enough, right? That's my, my laziness as a child. Um, it's just, Horatius is such an amazing story um, of somebody who puts his own life on the line for his community right and this is yeah i mean we don't i don't think we you know think 
often enough about, you know, that, that tension between individual and community and that self-sacrificing for the community, um, which he survives, right? But he puts his life on the line for that. Uh, Horatius, like, I mean, even that, right? I mean, the fact that we're still, you know, writing poems about him mm-hmm. centuries later uh, gives the students this this model and sort of just the challenge itself is is one that is of of memorizing that poem is one that is formative to the students mm-hmm. um and you know it's one thing what I remember reading climbing Parnassus and just being struck by how Tracy Lee Simmons there makes the point that we learn Latin one of the major reasons we learn Latin is for the discipline mm-hmm. And you know it's the same thing with with Horatius. Horatius, absolutely. It's, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Well, it's so memorable, and and I would encourage parents, um, you know, to to do this, mm-hmm. yeah. to to shoot for this moon and to shoot for the seventy stanzas, right? And right. and we do some neat things for students. Yeah, send that, in, send in that, a video that, of, right? of your student doing the seventy um, stanzas. Tanya will send out a medal and a <clears throat> that's pin and a certificate the whole deal like it's but even even if and i'm gonna say i'm at 50 percent, and what i mean by that (laughs) is i've got two kids that did the 70 and i have two kids that did the 24 yeah so even if you shoot for the moon you land among the stars and and you do that 24 it is still so valuable to your homeschool to your student i mean it's such a memorable experience i would not tell anyone to miss it right at all don't miss the story for pete's sake (laughs) You know, right. but don't miss that challenge, yeah. that mountain that you climb, even if you're just doing uh, the the 24. So right. yeah. um, that's what I wanted to say part of, yeah. about Horatius. Yeah. But of no, course, it's... you had so much more beautiful to say. <laughs> so, so then, but we also have in these years Homer. And these are two of the greatest books of the ancient world, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which you kind of, we already talked about in literature. If we didn't have the precursor of the, the book, The Trojan War. Right. You come upon this, and it would be a little bit more difficult. It will be more know? difficult. It will be more difficult. Uh, not undoable, but, you know, I mean, right. but but these are two very important yeah. stories. And those, I mean, those study guides are helpful because they're pointing out that, I mean, because Homer will refer to somebody by multiple <laughs> names, right? Yes. And so the study guides got important people in, you know, places so that you can identify who he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um but it is also, I mean, it's a pivotal thing for the students because it's like their first real great book from the cl- ancient world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, you know, we try to make it a big deal when when students learn it. But it it's also just, I mean, to to struggle with this idea of of a war where everybody on the same side is not in agreement about what they're doing. Right. I mean, that's, it's the anger of Achilles. Who's just mad at his own people. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not that he's mad at his enemies. He's mad at his own people. And, and again, that struggle with community, like what does it mean to be respected in your own community? The Greek idea of hubris. There's a lot going on in the Iliad. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you know, they're, they're beautiful stories. Uh, they are hard stories. They are hard it's, stories. You know, if you need if, to wait till ninth grade, it's fine. That's right. Now it's also another one though, that I used, um, you know, books. Uh, um, auditory books. Um, right. At that point in time, some of them were on CD. <laughs> that takes me back. <laughs> right. Okay, but it is an it is another example where we just had that extra help. Yeah. Um, to get through uh, these stories. So so then we move on to ninth grade book of the ancient Romans, and then Virgil's Aeneid, mm-hmm. the story of Christianity. Now Virgil's Aeneid being that um, gift to Augustus Caesar, the great Roman epic. I mean, the right. Greeks had their epics, so Augustus Caesar had to have his too, right? <laughs> Which is um, a rehash of which a rehash yeah, it is yeah. it, it 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 is um under you know roman values and virtues and, right. and and things like that so so equally important in these books of the ancient world. that's right well and and really the aeneid is important to set you up for dante right um it's it's it important is, just for itself so right as being roman and and that sort of thing but it does set you up for dante then the other thing, though, is I would say, you know, I found when I was teaching uh, students at Highlands Latin School, I found that they didn't nearly struggle with the Aeneid the way they did with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Because once Agreed. they get through the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, this is this is a, we're seeing similarities and, and contrast to, um, in the Aeneid to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so they're, they're much more comfortable already in that, in, in those ancient texts, mm-hmm. just after that one year. Right. I found. So then we move on to Greek tragedies. 
Paul, I want to tell you, I have no experience there. (laughs) You know, it's not, I've not been there. It's on my bucket list. Okay. I do have a bucket list. Um, (laughs) I talked about that with Tanya, but, um, you know, we move into Greek tragedies and history of the early church. And that is, is 10th grade. And that gets us into something. The next one that I'm super excited about, but what can we say about Greek tragedies? Greek tragedies, you know, there's, um, um, there's one of them, and I believe it's Antigone. I know we're going to get emails about this. Uh, I believe it's Antigone, but there's a story of this. I think it's the daughter of the king who wants to. The king has has ish, has ordered that this person's body not be buried. She um, defies the order, right? And it's and it's this struggle between do I obey the law of the gods, which is to respect this person and bury them. Or the law of man, right? It's it's the exact same um, issue that is that is um, presented to Christ by the Pharisees, right? Do, do, should we pay taxes to taxes to Caesar, right? What what is the law of man? But you know, what is its relation to the law of God? Um, and so these are these are great human questions, and by addressing those through the the best um, sort of outworkings of that in in the Greek culture, we're dealing with it from from a culture and from a society of people that yes did not have the light of revelation, but were asking the human questions that needed to be asked, mm-hmm. and so it really does give um, you know I mean that's what we're doing all through literature and classical studies is what does it mean to be human right, and so those. I, I would not skip over those lightly. I might cut back a few, um, but Oedipus Rex, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. the story. When we read the, the the trilogy, right, of of Oedipus the King, um, you know, and this tragedy that befalls him, and what you know, uh, what are the results of our actions, and all of those sorts of questions. That again, you know, yeah, you can just read them for the story. They're fascinating stories. You're like, ooh, what you know, kind of like you know just watching a, uh, what am I going for? Um, a train crash, right? You can't, you can't, <laughs> can't keep your eyes away from wreck, this. It's you know, going to happen. But, um, but it does, it does give us an opportunity to, to hash those things out. Right. But it also sets us up for what's coming next. You know, the 11th and 12th grade, mm-hmm. the, um, to Cicero's Republic and the laws and on obligations, um, St. Saint, Saint Augustine, City of God. Right. I mean, here we get right. into Christian apologetics and metaphysics. And oh my goodness, if there's any trajectory for right. us to see, right. um, this right. is the beauty and for me, such a pinnacle. Right. And what we're doing in those, in those classical Christian studies is, you know, like once we finish the history, mm-hmm. right, we spend a few years on their literature, the Homer, Virgil, um, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles, and then we start going into okay. Now that we know their culture better, so we've learned their history, we've learned their literature. What are their ideas, right? What are their ideas about political philosophy and and what how society should be set up? Let's let's contrast that with later ancient Christian ideas of Augustine, City of God. Then let's talk about okay, what is their philosophy? What is their theology, right? And that's where we end up. We we do read more Cicero. Mm-hmm. Um, because we want them to understand the Epicurean and Stoic philosophies. Cheryl didn't want that to be missed because Stoicism has a huge influence on our on our Christian church today. Yes, um, and Epicureanism has a huge influence on society on, on on general secular culture. So you know, but then we end up in Boethius, and and the students absolutely loved Boethius. I love Boethius um, because Boethius takes these these pagan Christian ideas. And from a Christian perspective, you know, wrestles with, because he's in prison when he's writing this for something he felt was a just action, right? Mm-hmm. The, the then reigning monarch was mad that Boethius had gone to the Pope to try to broker a peace deal. And it just, you know, he was mad. So he threw him in jail, right? And Boethius was like, I'm going to get killed over this. <laughs> and, but he's, he's struggling to find peace and the, the apologetics, I mean, reading Mere Christianity, Orthodoxy, if you want to know my thoughts on Mere Christianity, listen to Classical, et cetera, they came up <laughs> yesterday. Um, you know, Orthodoxy and um, I think Craves Fundamentals of the Faith. Yes. 
But just, you know, <clears throat> just getting reasons for those fundamental Christian tenets, mm-hmm. right? Which is, um, you know, our, our, our students, you know, whether they're homeschoolers or, you know, at Highlands that are stewing in a Christian culture, you know, we don't, we, we need them, as Peter says, to have reasons for your faith, right? And so we want them to have that, you know, on their way out that they've struggled with it with us. And so then when they walk out the door, they, they are able to, um, I mean, they'll still struggle, but they'll have some tools in their tool belt. Amen. So Paul, that was a lot. That was a lot on classical and Christian studies. That was a lot on literature, but we've got two more we're going to get through. I'll do, I'll do it quick. And I'll we're do, it quick. do it quick. So, right. but they're, but these are two that deserve time, but we're going to have to do them they quick. Do. Okay. So we've got composition Yes. and we have logic. Yeah. So composition, we come, we are continuing in the one that I can never say right. <laughs> the progymnosmata. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I am human. Oh my goodness. So human. Um, we have these classical composition levels uh, that we're still um, mm-hmm. moving through four through eight. Um, you know, they each have very specific names, but but where are we getting with this and, and with composition? I mean, this is yeah. such an important program. Right. So, I, I mean, in composition, you have grammar and mechanics and you have uh, style and arrangement. And y- y'all can get mad at me for not bringing up all five canons of rhetoric. It's fine. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've tried to address grammar and mechanics through work in our literature guides and our English grammar recitation program and Latin. Um, and what the composition program is doing is helping them with that the content of their arguments, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, so, you know, one one of the most uh, persuasive elements of anything is telling a story, right? Um, That's why we tell stories on podcasts, right? Because all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's human and I want to relate to that. And um, it's it's more than just the logical argument, right? And so that's why we start with fable and narrative, right? So that's what we're working towards, but when you get through common topic, so in, in was this and that fable, would be eighth, is that eighth grade? Narrative, I'm getting there. Yeah. Uh, Graham Haxon, <laughs> refutation, confirmation. <laughs> so seventh grade is refutation, confirmation. Right. Uh, that's when we're refuting and confirming stories. Common topic is when we're refuting and confirming ideas. And if you get through common topic, you're basically ready for a college level paper where you can argue, you have the tools to argue um, at that level. Okay, which I'm sorry that your eighth grader can argue at a college level, but you know it, it's true. It, you it's will, true. You will feel the the um the the bad side of that at the dinner table when they're asking to <laughs> play their video games or whatever. Um, everything after that, encomium, invective, comparison. Encomium is just a praise. Invective is is stirring up an audience, that sort of thing. Everything after that is stylistic, mm-hmm. largely, and so. Um, while that's that's wonderful to get to, and after common topic, they're largely semester courses, um, you know, or you can just take a year and just do them slowly. But um, you know, if you get through common topic and you need to stop the program, you can do that. But just make sure they're writing in other subjects, right? Make sure they're applying that elsewhere. Make sure they're you know in history or literature, classical studies, science. You know, ha- make sure they're writing. Um, in order to, 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 you know, because that is a skill that as they get older, there's more honing to be done there. You right. know, you, even if you have a phenomenal writer at eighth grade, if he doesn't keep writing through high school, he's not going to be ready for college. Well, that's writing. why the, the program does continue. There are three more levels. You mentioned the incoming and vector comparison, characterization and description and the thesis mm-hmm. um, and law, but you've, you've really made a good point. Yeah. Get through common topic. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, look, Thesis in law is the culmination of it, it right? I mean, to be able to write a good thesis paper, right? And law is not, don't think about this, about arguing in a courtroom. It's more, it would be more along the lines of constitutional law, whether a law ought to exist or not, mm-hmm. um, which, which again, it's phenomenal ways to discuss. And us being members of democracy, we need to be able to have those conversations, right? So there's great value. There's a, there's a huge amount of value. Um, and so if you can get through it, absolutely get through it. But make sure this isn't the only writing you're doing in your in your entire education. Right. Okay. 
So we're going to finish with logic. Mm-hmm. This is what I, where I think Memory Press, another area that we're set apart in. Of course, I think we're set apart in a whole lot of areas, but <laughs> I'm biased, totally biased. But, you know, this is a, something that you just don't find students doing right. um, or right. doing well, can I say Correct. that? Correct. So we, you know, here we have all of this that we talked about in part one, part two, and this is why I put logic last. <laughs> <laughs> look, look um, logic. So, so in some ways, every subject is is a means to an end, right? We want it, We're trying to build skills, but some things are 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 ends and of themselves, right? It is just a good thing to have read Treasure Island, Carrie. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Was that a, was that a dig? <laughs> it was. Um, <laughs> But I really put logic in the in in the category of this really is purely a means to an end. We want our students to have the habit of thinking well, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, you will they will learn in traditional logic too the the all the valid forms of a syllogism. And there's a mnemonic device, Barbara Cheller and Derry Ferio, right, for them to memorize what the valid forms are. Those it's important to go through that. But our goal is not that when they graduate high school or college that they can name them all back to us. Right. Because by doing those exercises again and again and again, that's why I say if you're doing traditional logic one and two, you can do that in ninth grade. They're a semester apiece. Mm-hmm. You could do them as seventh or eighth graders, but you're going to have to take a year because it's just harder. It's, it's harder. more abstract. I, I, I would say high yeah. school. Yeah. I mean, ninth grade's really, I mean, ninth grade or later is the best time to do it. But, you know, don't skip any of the exercises. No. Do them all because you're yes. trying to form that 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 pattern of thought. Even if you have to slow it down. Yeah. Just yeah, slow it down. Don't do skip. that. Um go to material logic. Material next. logic is next, tenth grade. Um that is uh, you know, in the online academy for our for our meta metaphysics, our introduction to classical Christian philosophy course. <laughs> um material logic is listed as a prerequisite because it deals with causation, it deals with definitions, it deals with uh, comprehension and extension, a whole lot of uh, of fundamental philosophical conceptual things Mm -hmm. that is helpful when you're having any sort of dialogue about anything where you have to make distinctions. And so uh, it really, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's fundamental uh, just in, in to set us up for higher patterns of thought. And we end up with rhetoric and you end up with rhetoric, which is the theory of rhetoric. Don't think that we're going to get your kid up on a soapbox to, to give their own speech. Right. Right. There is some work in that. And we have, you know, if you use the figures of speech and how to read a book supplements that are there, um, where, you know, Martin has put some, some of that, those activities in there, but that's not the thrust of the course. The thrust of the course is to understand persuasion, mm-hmm. right? And to, to know when we're being persuaded and how to persuade others, right? Um, and again, I, I tell people all the time, I do not want your kid learning logic and rhetoric if they are not fundamentally grounded in what is true, good, and beautiful, because they're going to become a sophist and they're just going to go around convincing people of those things which are not true. So so this is these are skills that have to be about based on a good foundation. That's right. And that's so. why they are high school. They're after much of what our students have studied in the land of virtue and who we are as human beings. That's right. Paul, thank you so much. I'm so glad that everyone got a personal introduction um, <laughs> to Paul um, here and, and a little bit more insight into Memorial Press Online Academy and the trajectory and the things that we want to do with our homeschool students and our homeschoolers in Memory Press. Glad to be here. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us today. If you liked our episode, click the thumbs up button below or leave a comment to let us know what you thought. It always helps us to know if we've helped you. You can also click the bell icon and subscribe to the show so that you can stay in touch. Then I'd love for you to share it with a friend. We have many resources here on this channel, so I hope you'll check those out too. I'm Carrie McGraw. Thanks for listening today, and I'll see you next time.